Cool. All right. Um, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. You're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight we're going to talk about dhyana or jhana. And specifically what we're going to talk about is skillful dhyana or skillful jhana, which you could think of as skillful meditation. So this is going to be part of the series I've been doing for the last couple of weeks, which is a look at the paramitas, uh, a look, <clears throat> excuse me, a look at the practices of the bodhisattva. And so what we have been looking at are the practices of giving, <clears throat> the practice of moral discipline, the practice of patience, the practice of determination, Tonight, it's meditation, <clears throat> and next Sunday, it'll be wisdom. But specifically, we're sort of approaching these six practices of the bodhisattva. We're approaching them in terms of upaya, because that's the theme for this. Uh, the last few sessions has been skillful means. And so this is a, a unique, special look at these different practices from this kind of uh, through the lens of the Bodhisattva path. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so we're going to talk about dhyana, or it also in the Pali language, it's called jhana. And I want to kind of start with some general remarks about, mm, sort of about meditation, and then we're kind of going to move into more specific ideas about meditation. Before we even talk about skillful meditation. So an idea came up last week that I wanted to kind of mention. And what came up last week was <clears throat> it's a way of dividing, excuse me. <clears throat> it's a way of dividing the Buddhist teachings into these three general categories called shila, samadhi, and pranya. So kind of virtue or moral discipline, samadhi, meditation, and then finally pranya, insight or wisdom. And the idea here is what I kind of wanted to talk about was the sangha, our community here. And Mainly what I wanted to talk about was, <clears throat> you know, at the San Francisco Dharma Collective, there's a lot of classes that are meditation-based. And that's a really important part of the Sangha, that it is like a, um, <clears throat> a support network for your meditation practice in that way. And I think that that's a really valuable part of a sangha or a community is that kind of support network for meditation. And I know that we on Sunday nights, I know that we don't do meditation, at least not formal meditation. And that's because I kind of see the Dharma doors, I see this class as focused very much on the pranya side of things very much on that insight part of Buddhist practice. Now, another part of the Sangha, which I only talk a little bit about, is shila, moral discipline. Things like following the precepts, basically ideas of, <clears throat> excuse me, ideas of right speech, right action, right livelihood, things like that. And the Sangha can also be a support network for Shila. And traditionally, the Sangha is very much a support network for Shila. And what I mean by that is it's, it's a community that encourages virtuous behavior, but it's also the Sangha is a community where you can go to, to confess, for lack of a better term, sort of own up to transgressions and be heard by the community in that way. So my point is, is that tonight, 
you know, we might do some meditation, like actual dhyana or something like it. We might a little bit later. I'm going to see how things go. But I just wanted to sort of address the fact that the Dharma doors is about pranya. And that's a, an important part of the practice in that way. So a lot of what I have to say tonight is sort of looking at meditation from the perspective of wisdom in that way. And that kind of fits in with what we're kind of really talking about tonight, which is skillful meditation. How does one meditate up upayakly or skillfully? Well, in order to sort of get to that idea, I want to have a general conversation about dhyana. So again, dhyana is this fifth paramita. It's this fifth aspect of the bodhisattva practice. And you could, if you really wanted to, you could divide the six paramitas into the three categories of shila, samadhi, and pranya. But I think it's probably better just to keep those three general categories in mind. And the general idea being that the morality aspect of this, which would include things like being generous, giving, observing the precepts, there's a way in which in most forms of Buddhism, Shila is considered preparatory for meditation and wisdom. That there's a way in which the purification process by being virtuous clears up the mind in a way that allows for it to meditate and allows for insights to arise. So since we've been doing the six paramitas, we've really been looking at a lot of things that are preparatory for dhyana. So here's the thing about dhyana. How do we translate this word into English? It's normally probably translated as meditation. It is sometimes translated as concentration, but samadhi is also sometimes translated as concentration. And there's generally understood to be a difference between dhyana and samadhi. So what is dhyana, right? Well, <clears throat> I know I'm very aware that there's a lot of teachers of jhana, also called dhyana. I know that there's a lot of different teachers with a lot of different approaches to these topics and, and like what exactly is going on with dhyana. You know, back in the, um, back in like the 60s and the 70s, they would translate dhyana as a trance, like a trance state. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't, I think, I definitely think the idea of a trance sort of like captures something about dhyana in that way. But there's a clue. And for me, there's a really big clue about the nature of dhyana. And what it is, is that you are, I'm sure you are familiar, and if not, we're going to talk more about it, but I'm sure you're familiar with there being these four sort of stages or four levels of dhyana. They kind of get so-called deeper and deeper and deeper, and then a fourth deepest dhyana. Again, these are sometimes called jhanas as well. And there's a clue as to the nature of a dhyana, a dhyanic state. And the clue is that these are always called rupa jhanas or rupa dhyanas. Form, form dhyanas. What does that mean? Rupa, form or shape dhyana, right? Well, the way that I approach meditation, the way that I approach Buddhist meditation, the way I approach the dhyanas, 
is through the understanding of what is called the triple realm or the three realms. We talk about it a lot in Dharma doors, but the three realms are the so-called realm of desire, the Kamadatu, the Rupa Datu, the realm of form, and the third formless realm. I'm not going to talk a lot about the formless realm tonight because that's actually the realm of samadhi, or at least it's traditionally understood to be the realm of samadhi. And a number of weeks ago, maybe even months, but a while ago, I did a Dharma talk called the, the Samadhi of Skateboarding. And in that Dharma talk, we focused on the Samadhi states. And I would even call that talk that I gave, I would call that a talk on skillful Samadhi. That was very much an upayic approach to Samadhi. So I'm not going to talk about Samadhi tonight so much, which again has to do with that third formless realm. And formless, you know, means like, woo, like space. No, nothing to see there, nothing to smell there, nothing to hear, just formlessness. So that's a pretty exalted state of meditation. So we're just going to leave that over there. And so for the remainder of sort of this evening, I really want to be looking at what is called the realm of desire versus the realm of form, the rupa dattu, the rupa realm, realm of rupa. And as far as I understand, and again, this is just my, the way I study, the way I've learned this, but to be in a jhana or again, a dhyana, is to be in the realm of form. If you're if 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 you are in the realm of desire at all, that is not being in a dhyana, like by almost by definition in that way. So what do we mean by the realm of desire? <laughs> well, there's a lot of ways that we could conceive of the realm of desire too. And again, I've done a lot of different Dharma talks about the triple realm. So I've said a lot in Dharma Door's past, I've said a lot about Kama, K-A-M-M-A, -M -M -A, Kama, the, the realm of desire. But tonight, I kind of wanted to give everyone just a very simple way of thinking about the realm of desire versus the realm of form, which we are now tonight saying this is kind of synonymous with being in a jhana or a dhyanic state. So when it comes to the difference between these two realms, I think a really key emotion to pay attention to is something along the lines of boredom. <laughs> My point being that if you sit in meditation, so you're going to do you know, what the Japanese call zazen, uh, sitting dhyana, Zen, by the way, if you didn't know, Zen means dhyana. So if you're going to be doing a seated meditation, and if you're sitting there and you're bored, <laughs> that is a clear indication that you are in the realm of desire because it means you want something. Like you, you, you are, boredom indicates a kind of wanting to be entertained to some degree, but wanting to see something, wanting to hear something or smell or eat something or touch something or touch someone, or even just be thinking about something like uh, uh, doing a puzzle or, you know, doing something with the mind. And the point is, is that all of that wanting and eating or smelling or thinking and all of those things are in the realm of desire. And it doesn't have to get out of hand is my point tonight. What I mean is, is that traditionally the realm of desire, like Kama, like you might've heard of the Kama Sutra. Kama is traditionally about sexuality. It's normally about you know, wanting sexual pleasure. 
But tonight I'm not taking it to that level of like that kind of wanting. I'm at a very kind of low level, <laughs> low level dissatisfaction. Again, just basic boredom. And I know, trust me, I, I struggled with boredom and meditation all through like my 20s. That was my big hurdle. And I recognized that that was a big hurdle for a lot of reasons. I was obviously conditioned to want to be entertained or conditioned to want to be thinking or doing those things in that way. And, and there was also sort of the problem of productivity, which many of us have, which is the problem of feeling as if I'm wasting my time. The idea that just sitting there is a waste of time and that I could be doing something more productive, there could be nothing more desire-ish, <laughs> nothing more in the realm of desire than the idea of productivity, the, that idea of wanting to get something done. But so just notice that all of these emotions that I'm describing are about a kind of wanting, a sort of, and you could get to the point where it's craving, right? That kind of tanha, that thirsty craviness that the Buddhists talk about. But my whole point is, is that a struggle, a, a basic struggle of meditation from a Buddhist point of view is getting out of the realm of desire, like get, removing ourselves from that. And there's only kind of one way to overcome that, and it's from practice. <laughs> and what I mean is, is it's the practice of quiet sitting <laughs> and getting better at sitting quietly in that way. So we are now kind of talking about this being in the realm of desire, which is all these things that we would want to be doing or crave to be doing and all of that. And then what we're working on is getting into a jhana, getting into a dhyanic state, which again, by definition, would be in that realm of form. And I'm going to describe that realm of form, but we want to kind of get there in that sense. So going back to the realm of desire where all of this starts, there's also sort of something else to consider. When it comes to Buddhist meditation and most forms of meditation, what we're up against is, you know, what the Buddhists call the monkey mind, the monkey mind that jumps from one sense pleasure to the next. And it's like, I'm over here with these sense pleasures. Ooh, what's that sense pleasure? That looks fun. Boink. Do -do 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 -do. I'm bored with this. That one looks fun. Boink. Wait, what was that? Tell me more. Bah, bah, bah. And so the mind jumping all around. And in particular, we're interested in noticing the way that, you know, basically shiny objects and things grab our attention and uncontrollably we delight in them or we are averse to them or whatever it is. So the point is, is that we're trapped in this kind of like monkey mind that's jumping around and that's used to jumping around. And so there's a technique. There's a Buddhist technique for taming the monkey mind. There's a technique for transcending the realm of desire and kind of getting into the realm of form, which again would be a jhana. And that technique for doing that is anchoring the mind, locking the mind in on a focus. And this process of locking the mind into a focus is called either sati in the Pali language or smrti in the Sanskrit language. That word pronounced two different ways, sati or smrti, that word, of course, means kind of mindfulness or recollection. And again, what that is, what sati shmurti is, 
is focusing the mind on an object. And we're going to talk about the way different objects that that could be. <clears throat> but by having a focus, the monkey mind is being trained to just pay attention to that, uh, that object. Now, the monkey mind is going to want to jump to that object and then that object and then that object. And the monkey mind is probably going to be jumping around in time, by which I mean sometimes the monkey mind is in a process of remembrance, meaning it's bringing up ideas from the past and like kind of either reliving things that have already happened or, you know, ideas like regret, regretting something that had happened, wishing something else would have happened, but being, being in the past. Oh, but the monkey mind, boink, loves to jump to the future too, making plans, making plans for tomorrow, making plans for the future, worrying about the future. <laughs> So the monkey mind is in the future worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow. Oh, but regretting what happened yesterday. So monkey mind is jumping around to past, future, present, and jumping around object to object to object. So what we need to do is anchor the mind. Focus it on something. Now, the monkey mind is going to want to jump to something else, and it probably will. So the technique is to return to the original focus. Now, that's the general approach of sati or shmirti, an anchor for the monkey mind, a focus. In Buddhism, there are four foci, four focuses, if you will, that are recommended. And these are four focuses that are recommended in a particular order. You know these as the four foundations of mindfulness. And it all begins with using the body as the anchor of the monkey mind. So what we are really talking about with the first foundation of mindfulness to escape the realm of desire and get into a dhyana, we want to become aware of our body. Now, this puts us into a present mode of being. So by coming back to the body and the, the, the experience of being embodied, the monkey mind, excuse me, the monkey mind isn't jumping to the past. It's going to want to jump to the past, but we can return to the present because our focus is the body. The monkey mind is going to jump to the future, but we can bring it back to the present by focusing on the body. And specifically, the Buddha tends to recommend the breath, breathing, as a particular aspect of the body to begin with. So what we're going for is an actual awareness of the entire body, from the crown of the head to the bottoms of your feet, the entire body. We want to come into a full body awareness. And we can accomplish that by beginning with the breathing, the experience of breathing. Now, again, we're not in a dhyana. Just because we're doing anapanasati, which is mindfulness of breathing, just because we're doing mindfulness of breathing does not mean we're in a jhana, at least not by my definition here tonight. But focusing the mind is what will bring that jhanic state about. So again, the monkey mind is going to want to jump around. And so we're going to keep coming back to the breathing. And what the Buddha talks about is, is that we really just want to be aware of whether we're inhaling or exhaling. If we happen to be holding our breath, 
we want to be aware of that too. So we want to just be aware of what the breath is doing. And it's a really good technique for being mindful of the breathing. It's to be aware of, am I, am, am I, is this an inhale? Is a, are the lungs expanding? Is my chest rising? Is my, are my shoulders rising? Or is my chest falling? Is, are my lungs collapsing? Am I exhaling? And by being aware of where you're at in the breathing cycle, that is a kind of a, a very fine-tuned way of being in harmony with the breath. Now, some meditation teachers recommend counting the breathing as a technique for coming back to the breath. Th that works for a lot of people. Again, it's a technique. But what we really want to be doing is being mindful of the breathing. Now, what the four foundations of mindfulness, what that system sort of talks about, is eventually kind of expanding that awareness from the breathing to the entire body. And it's not that we've lost awareness of the breath. It's that the breath is now being experienced throughout the entire body. And so by continuing to focus on the breathing and coming back to the breathing, the mind begins to slow down. Because the monkey mind isn't jumping around through time as much, and maybe because the monkey mind isn't jumping to external objects as much, the mind begins to calm down. Now, the idea here is, is that as you are meditating on the body, it starts to become a part of the practice to be aware of the fact that the sensory organs, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the brain, mind, that those are, especially the brain, all of those are aspects of the physical body in that sense. And so one recommendation for body awareness, a technique to keep coming back to the body, a technique is to then begin <clears throat> to go start to go through the sensory organs as aspects of the body. So becoming aware of visual sensations, and you could basically be aware of, if you have your eyes closed, you are aware that you're <clears throat> not seeing anything or seeing the back of your eyes. Becoming aware of hearing, becoming aware of the smell, becoming aware of any taste in the mouth, becoming aware of anything going on in the body by which I'm kind of referring to any physical discomfort, and then eventually bringing attention to the mind itself, the activities of the mind. Now, from these sense organs of the body, we can now move to the second foundation of mindfulness, the second anchor for the monkey mind. But the idea is, is that the monkey mind has now calmed down and is now very present with the body. That's the idea of the first foundation to bring us really into the present experience. <clears throat> the second foundation of mindfulness is Vedana, sensations, but specifically, sensations, vedana, are pleasant, painful, or neutral reactions to sensations. Meaning, you could now, in the second foundation, you could begin with the eyes, and you could notice whether you are having a positive reaction to what you are seeing, a negative reaction, maybe the lights are too bright and they're hurting your eyes, like your eyes are straining and it's discomfortable. Or maybe you just have your eyes closed and there's really no 
pleasant, pleasant feeling or painful feeling. It's just sort of dark and neutral. So you become aware of the feeling tone, which is what a lot of meditation teachers describe Vedana as, the feeling tone. Again, is your visual experience pleasing or not pleasing or neutral? And we are just want to be aware of the way that we're reacting to these things. All of this, all of this, body awareness, sensorial awareness, we are trying to be very passive observers. We're not actually even trying to uh, like change anything exactly. We really just want to notice the way the breathing was going and now begin to notice the way the senses are reacting or the way we are reacting to sensory experience. After the eyes, you could move to the ears and you could ask yourself, am I having a negative reaction or a positive reaction to what I'm hearing? Or is it just total silence and there's really no negative or positive reaction? So it's kind of neutral. How about smell? Is there a foul, stinky odor in the room? Maybe I'm burning a little incense and it's quite lovely and I'm having a positive reaction to that. Next, you can move to the mouth. Maybe before your meditation, you just ate something and you still have a lingering taste in your mouth. Maybe it's a pleasant taste. Maybe you haven't brushed your teeth all day and it's kind of stinky and you're having a negative reaction to the taste in your mouth. Again, we would just want to notice the sensorial reaction. We don't exactly want to judge it. We don't, or we don't want to judge it at all, but we are just noticing it. And then after those sensory organs, we could bring our attention to the body. That could be internal. Maybe I have a stomach cramp from what I ate earlier and I notice the stomach cramp. Or maybe I have a, a lower back pain from sitting or whatever it is, but we become aware of the body and any discomfort. Or Maybe we're beginning to notice that just sitting here, the body has relaxed and it's very comfortable. But again, we just notice, we notice pleasant feeling, displeasurable feelings in the body. And now, after we've gone through the five external sensory organs and have noted the feeling tone of each of those, then we can bring our attention to the mind. And the idea of the mind is that the mind is also sensing things, but it's not sensing visible forms. It's not sensing sound or smells or flavors or tactile sensations. The mind is sensing and responding to ideas. These could be memories. This could be an internal dialogue. Whatever it is, the sixth sensory organ of the, the mind brain, we also want to attend to in this meditative focus state. And we wanna be aware Am I having a negative reaction to what the mind is conjuring up? Maybe I have a memory of something from earlier in the day that bothers me. It's like an unpleasant memory. We would want to notice I'm having a negative sensory reaction to that memory or that idea. But the main thing that we're doing with all of this is we are noticing that the experience that we are presently having is the culmination of all of those reactions 
to what we're seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and thinking about. And so it's helpful in this meditative mode to disambiguate what I'm seeing from what I'm hearing, from what I'm smelling, tasting, touching, and thinking about. And so we could sort of notice exactly where the agitation is coming from in that way. Or if, for example, the mind is not pleased with what it's thinking about, but we realize that what we're seeing is very calm and very like kind of cool in that way. And if we notice that what we're hearing is very calm and what we're smelling is very calm and what we taste is very calm and even the way that our body feels is very calm, there's a way in which we can sort of focus on all of that calmness and that alleviates some of the displeasure from whatever reaction we're having to the mind in that way. So all of this is the second foundation of mindfulness. And that second foundation of mindfulness, again, is all about the culmination of reactions into your present experience. Now, the idea is, is that because we've used the body, number one, the body as an anchor, that has allowed the mind, the monkey mind, to calm down. Not jumping around, but really focused on this body situation. And because the mind and everything is calmed down a bit, we can now focus on the sensory reactions that I was just describing. And that process brings us to the third foundation of mindfulness, chitta, the state of mind that you are presently in. That is the what I was describing as the culmination of all the reactions you're having to the sensations of the body. And so this present mind state can be analyzed in terms of things like anger, frustration, or joy, or pleasure, or bliss, any number of sort of mind states. But what we are now doing in the third foundation of mindfulness is passively observing our own state of mind. And we are aware of whether we're in an angry state of mind, a frustrated state of mind, again, any different kind of state of mind. But what we're aware of is that that state of mind is originating from the way I'm reacting to the six senses. And so because of that, we can now passively observe the mind in this state. <clears throat> and the idea of all of this, by the way, is that as we move through the foundations of mindfulness, the monkey mind is getting even more grounded, even more centered, more focused, less jumping around, until finally, when we're in this third foundation of mindfulness, there's a way in which we should be very present. So present because the only thing that we're really entertaining or the only thing that we're really considering is our own state of mind. And then if one successfully gets into a calm, meditative, focused state of awareness on the mind itself, but again, I mean chitta, a mind state, then from that, we can move to the fourth foundation of mindfulness. And the fourth foundation of mindfulness is just called dharmas. Now, there's a few different ways to understand the fourth foundation of mindfulness. What I want to talk about is an example from the suttas, from the early teachings, but it's one of the many dharmas by which we're talking about teachings or truths 
or principles or laws, these like fundamental principles of the world or the universe, dharmas. And one set of dharmas, one set of truths or principles that we could think about are the four great elements. So the idea is, is that the teaching or a teaching is the teaching of the four elements. And the four elements is an Indian slash Buddhist way of understanding the physical world. And the four elements, of course, are earth, fire, water, and air. But as I often tell everybody who will listen, it seems to me that earth is about solidity. How solid is it? Whereas water is about liquidity or viscosity. How flowy is it? Fire is about temperature, everything having a temperature. And wind or air is about movement, specifically self-movement, meaning things that have a lot of wind element tend to exhibit life, meaning that they move all by themselves. <laughs> So if something is moving all by itself, it has a lot of wind element, and it might be alive. A human being, for example, comes in at 98.6 usually on the fire element, on the temperature element. A living human being who has a 98.6 fire element usually is full of wind element, full of moving, and by the way, is breathing. So that's the wind element. And then all the rest of this is about the bones, which are more dense than the organs, which are uh, more dense than the skin, which is very liquidy, the blood, the tears, the urine, all of that are the, the various forms of water, the water element. And so what I'm getting at is, is that the fourth foundation of mindfulness, dharmas, after one has calmed the mind down by focusing on the body and then the senses or sensory reactions, and then the mind state that is arising from the body and the sensory reactions, now with a clear observation of the mind, we can begin to think in terms of dharmas. So again, that's the fourth foundation. So we begin to think in terms of dharmas. And I'm using the example of thinking in terms of the four elements. So what I mean is, is noticing the body now in the fourth foundation of mindfulness, we would be noticing the body, but strictly in terms of density, liquidity, temperature, and movement. We would notice now the heart beating, but not as the heart beating. We would just notice the movement of it. We would notice the liquid in our mouth. We would notice and be thinking about how the skull and the bones are more dense. But what I'm getting at is, is that we are really breaking down this body into the, just these four elements and noticing the body strictly in terms of these four elements. And then what can begin to happen is a realization that the four elements, earth, wind, fire, and water, they're out there, the objects out there that I'm looking at, they're just configurations of earth, water, fire, and air as well. And so what I'm getting at is, is that through this process, we can start to come to a sense of 
equality, if you will, or equanimity between inside and outside, between self and other. And it's not that we don't understand that there's a difference between the skull and the air outside. It's just that we're beginning to understand, oh, the solidity that's out there is no different than the solidity that's in here. The liquidity, the viscosity in here is no different than the viscosity out there. And so on with the movement and the temperature. And it's just about realizing, oh, all of these different objects just have different solidity, liquidity, temperature, and movement, including me. But again, what this is doing is breaking down everything now self and other into strictly rupa. Rupa, this word that means form or shape, rupa is strictly about the four elements, things just in terms of the elements. And so what I kind of want you to be thinking about is you know, a perception of self that would be judgmental. You know, something like, oh, I don't know. Uh, I'm not tall enough. I don't know. I'm just pulling something random out of, out of, you know, the air. But if one has this kind of self-deprecating sense of I'm not tall enough, that is very much about being in the realm of desire, the realm of wanting. Whereas if you were in a meditative state in which you were just noticing the four elements, it would just be that the body is this big. It's this much mass. And there's, it's not too much mass or too little mass. <laughs> it's, just the, it's, it's just the amount of mass in that way. It's just the amount of density. It's just the amount of liquidity. It's just the amount of air. It's just the amount of temperature. Getting a fever, for example, it's just a different heat element. It's the mind that worries that would think, oh no, oh, you know, I got to bring this temperature down and this and that. Not to say you shouldn't try to bring a temperature down if it gets too high. But my point is, is that if one is judging critiquing and all of that, that's all the realm of desire. But if you were really strictly just in a world or a realm, they call it a realm, strictly in a realm where it was just about solidity, liquidity, temperature, and movement, that again would bring this kind of sense of equality. And Primarily for me, the way that I experience the transition between these things, like I was saying, when it's when I'm in the realm of desire, I get bored meditating. Whereas when I have moved into a dhyana, the first dhyana, which is this first initial entry into the realm of form, there is a, a, a great sense of delight a great mm -hmm. sense of freedom from not wanting or needing anything from actually being content from like, actually just I like, I'm good. <laughs> there, there's nothing here in that way to get worked up about. So that's our entry into the first jhana, which by this definition tonight is when we have entered into just this realm of form where we are aware of differences in shape, size, color, number. Again, we are aware of differences in the four elements, but again, there's no value to different configurations of the four elements. They're just different in that sense. And so from being in that state of, of kind of just form, the idea is, is that desire 
has subsided. And that's the key to being in a jhana is this kind of feeling again of not needing or wanting anything, feeling really good about it. And in most traditions, they describe the first jhana as being characterized by priti and sukha, uh, energy or bliss and great pleasure, sukha. The first jhana that we arrive, that we get to through the four foundations of mindfulness, that first jhana is also said to be with what we would call discursive thinking. And discursive thinking, if you ever see that expression, like in a Buddhist text, they're talking about the mind that is aware this is nice. <laughs> this is pleasant. This is blissful. This is sukha. This isn't like I was earlier today. This is nice. <laughs> so there is an internal dialogue still happening where there is this discursive talking consciousness that is comparing being in the first jhana to not being in the first jhana and is discursively aware, this is nice. This is just the realm of pure form. What they talk about is, is that that feeling of being in the first jhana where the mind is sort of very aware that this is a transition and that something has happened here, that in internal chatter subsides. And what they talk about is that in the second jhana or the second dhyana, there is still the priti, there is still the kind of energy or the, the kind of the, the rapturous feeling in that way. There is still ple pleasure, there is still sukha. But in the second jhana, there's just no longer the internal dialogue that's comparing it to not being that way. It's sort of just uh steeped in it in that way or steeping in that way so just experiencing it but without any reflection about it then what they talk about is that very sukha that very bliss or pleasure subsiding and so then from the subsiding of that kind of like excitement or bliss one enters the third jhana, which is characterized by upeksha. Now, often we, I, translate upeksha as equanimity. But I kind of need to tell you tonight that the word upeksha doesn't mean equality or equanimity. There's another word for that, which is samatha, samatha. Not shamatha, but samatha, sameness, is the word for equanimity or equality. Upeksha actually means relinquishment. Mm. And that relinquishment of the third jhana is this sort of letting go. And specifically what is being let go of is any interest or pursuit of pleasure over pain. By the way, the word that we are, that I just called pain, the word is dukkha. So dukkha is the suffering, is the discomfort, anxiety, all of that is dukkha versus sukkha. So sukha, if you've heard that word sukha, it's the exact opposite of dukkha. It's, again, it's bliss and rapture. Now the sukha that's experienced in the first two jhanas, they're a, a bliss from being independent of things. Mm -hmm. And what they say is, is that it's a much greater bliss than you could ever get from something 
the 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 greatest food you could eat the greatest you know music you could hear all the pleasures of the senses are nothing compared to the bliss of not needing sensory stimuli so that's in the first two jhanas but then by the third we have relinquished the pursuit of even pleasure and that's what brings us into this neutral zone, which is why they talk about upeksha as equanimity, because it's this neutral zone where we're kind of beyond dukkha and sukha. And by being in that state of relinquishment, one then enters the fourth and final form jhana, so the fourth jhana of the realm of form and this is this true what they talk about as being completely beyond pleasure and pain being completely equanimous in that sense like it's just fully embodied in that way and that brings us to the kind of end of our jhana meditation where all that whole process I just walked you to, through from establishing focused awareness using sati or shmurti, that idea of focused attention, going through the four foundations of mindfulness, and then via dharmas, entering just the realm of pure form, which then has these four successive kind of stages, deepening the practice, deepening the cultivation, and by the time one is in a fourth geonic state, the idea is, of course, that one really isn't bored <laughs> in that. In, in terms of what I mean is one is far removed from the realm of desire, far removed from the realm of wanting or craving in that way. Okay. I'm going to pause there. That was kind of actually a very long introduction to Diana. Any questions, comments, answers, ideas about meditation so far? By the way, I will. Oh, yeah, please. Darcy, is it? I think. Hello. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just cannot shut my brain off. Well, ever. But meditating. Oh, man. <laughs> Help. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not even logical. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for uh, this one speech. And I love your screen, by the way. Behind oh, you. Thank you. <clears throat> so I hear you. And Darcy, is that, the, is that right? Yeah, let's hope so. I hear you. And the only thing that I could really say to that, and it, it might not be the answer that you want to hear, but nonetheless. So, and, and actually, I'm very thankful for this question because it allows me to mention something that I really wanted to say. So, if You've studied uh, Buddhism before, or you know certainly if you've been to Dharma doors, you will know that a big part of like what Buddhism is interested in, it's interested in what would be called conditioned behaviors. You might, or it's that's what I call, or what how I translate the idea of samskara. Samskara are this idea of our of our habits are conditioned behaviors in that way. And in general, Buddhism sees us as being like extremely conditioned, extremely habitual. And part of that habit, part of that habitual habituation conditioning, a big part of it is, is that we are conditioned to need stimuli 
in that way of, again, of getting bored. We are conditioned into basically thinking all the time. It's like, that's the default mode, uh, especially of the human being of the of homo sapien. It's like, we're, you know, going, going, going. So everything that I just described and the Buddhist approach to meditation is basically a process of unconditioning ourselves. And, and this is the answer, again, that you, you might not want to hear. But the basic idea is, is that in order to uncondition ourselves, we sort of need to recondition ourselves to be content with just being. <laughs> that is in many ways what I just described was a way to get to a state where one is a little bit more content. And if you can get there just a, a fraction of a second, you'll have a better chance next time of it being two fractions of a second. <laughs> and then maybe a whole second, maybe even a whole second. But the idea is, is that as we come back to it, we are, again, you can think of it as unconditioning, deconditioning, reconditioning, however you want to think of it, but it takes practice. It takes recurring, just like anything, actually, you know, you want to be a good swimmer, you're not going to be able to just dive in and start swimming, you need to come back to it and condition the body to do it well. Same with meditation. We might not be very good at it at first, but we need to crack through at least for that first few seconds and allow the mind to stop cycling in that sense. And then again, it just becomes a practice where we keep coming back to it over and over and over again to where it becomes more normal. And then eventually the idea is, is that it becomes the default mode rather than the, def the default mode of the monkey mind, which is where we all start, is the idea. So, okay. Oh, thank you. All right. So before we uh, depart, as time slips by, I do want to now talk a little bit about skillful meditation. So I have a few different ways of approaching this idea of how could we approach meditation as an upaya. Interesting idea. How would the bodhisattva approach meditation? The first thing that I would mention, and it's this is sort of like an, an, a general statement about this, you'll remember from all of the classes that I've given all of last year, and then even all the classes I've done this year, They've all been focused on the bodhisattva path, the, the way of the bodhisattva. And the way of the bodhisattva is all about everybody else. It is all about, call it, you know, uh, awakening all sentient beings, uh, rescuing all sentient beings. There's, you know, a lot of different language for this idea of the bodhisattva, but the point of the bodhisattva and the practice of the bodhisattva is that it is entirely directed outwardly towards the others through the practice of giving, of course, being generous is very much about the other, very much about all sentient beings. I talked about in our, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about morality, observing the precepts. But what I talked about was how the bodhisattva is a moral person, is a, is a, observes the precepts, not for their own purification, but so that they are a good person in society, so that they are the best of service to others in that way. Same way with patience, same way with determination that we talked about last week, that one is sort of full of energy and full of drive and full of determination to inspire others to not be lazy and to put forth the effort in that way. So how could we meditate for all sentient beings? 
Well, one way, the first way to think about that is <clears throat> let's take something, uh, uh, let's take a different uh, discipline. I'm thinking of like um, just staying physically fit, like going to the gym, you know, or in, if you don't want to go to a gym, but just like, you know, jogging every day or whatever it is. One could approach physical fitness and going to the gym and jogging. One could approach that entirely from the perspective of the self, meaning I'm going to get to get, you know, uh, to look good. I'm going, you know, to get, you know, to get fit so that I could live for longer, for my health, for, you know, all of these reasons. And I don't want to dissuade anybody from being healthy and trying to live longer and trying to live better. Not at all. I, I definitely, yes, do it. <laughs> but what I want to point out is that there's a way in which we could go to the gym entirely for our own benefit, exclusively. But there's another way that one could go to the gym every day or one that could stay physically healthy. And the bodhisattva approach to physical uh, well-being in that sense, the idea of the bodhisattva is in order to serve all sentient beings, I need to be in the best shape possible. Because if I'm you know, not healthy, if I'm not, you know, kind of physically capable enough, I'm not going to be able to help everybody. And so I'm going to go to the gym every day, or I'm going to jog every day, or I'm going to stay physically fit. But my impetus, my reason for doing that is not for myself. It's for all sentient beings in that way. I would suggest that one could approach meditation the same way. And in the world of Buddhism, this is what they talk about. They talk about that in the Hinayana, in the Hinayana, the monks and the nuns and whoever it is, there's a way in which the idea is that they're meditating to enlighten themselves or to purify themselves. But the idea is, is that the practice is entirely for my benefit, for my liberation or my enlightenment. I would suggest that the bodhisattva's approach to meditation is that they understand that they're going to be going out into the world and they're going to be interacting with others all the time. Even, you know, even if I go to the grocery store, I'm going to interact with a bunch of people. And then I'm going to interact with my spouse or my family or my loved ones. I'm going to be interacting with all of these beings. And I could do that either with a monkey mind, all anxious and scatterbrained and all of that. Or I could interact with all of those people in a calm, peaceful state of mind. So I would do seated meditation, even on my own, just privately and quiet, for mental health, for the ability to be calm, for the ability to be kind of peaceful. But the reason why I would be doing it is because I recognize I'm no good to anybody if I have this scattered brain that's all full of, uh, you know, monkey mind in that way. <clears throat> So I would suggest that the bodhisattva's approach to meditation is kind of like that, where they're kind of not doing it for themselves, but they do recognize that it is for themselves. Like it, they recognize that it is helping their mind, but they recognize that that helps everybody out in that way. So that's the first way that I would address the idea of skillful meditation or skillful dhyana versus sort of a non-upayak dhyana. Non-upayak would mean that the, the impetus is not towards the other. It's strictly for one's own kind of own benefit in that way. The next 
kind of example of skillful meditation. This one's getting a little more, um, what would I call it? Like official, by which I mean, like this is something that you will actually find in the literature about the Bodhisattva path. It has to do with, well, you might know it as nirodha, cessation. In particular, if you're really, if you really know your dharma, you would know it as nirodha samapati, the attainment of cessation. And this is related to ideas of even nirvana, and then certainly like maha pari nirvana, like ultimate nirvana. So within the world of Buddhism, early Buddhism, if you remember, I said something uh, a number of a little while ago. It was in response to Darcy's question about um, kind of calming the mind down. And I mentioned that the Buddhist tradition is very interested in samskara, these conditioned behaviors. And ultimately, they're interested in eradicating habitual conditioned behaviors. In the early form of Buddhism, there was a general understanding, uh, like a psychological understanding, which basically said the only way to really get rid of the deep habitual uh, samskaras is to go into very deep states of meditation that are basically states of sensory deprivation and states of absolute stillness, nirodha, cessation, no samya, no perception, no vinyana, no consciousness, no experience. And this is, in the early tradition, these experiences of nirodha samapati could, could last up to like a week, where you are just in a still state of meditation, they talk about even uh, breathing, ceasing, stopped. And again, staying that way for prolonged periods of time, clearing out the samskara. And basically when we say clearing up or burning up, sometimes I use the language of burning up the samskara. It's not burning up or anything like that. It's actually about not repeating the same thing for a moment. <laughs> and so by virtue of not repeating the habit, it allows that habit to go away because it's not being uh, reinforced or repeated in that sense. Now, in the literature of the Bodhisattva path, they talk about basically that 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 form of really deep meditation, like the really, really deep where you're gone for like a week, that is not described as skillful meditation. In fact, the entire language of samapati, so samapati is called an attainment. And the way that you could think of that attainment. In fact, in the Theravada Buddhist tradition that is still alive and well in the world today, they talk a lot about samapati. They talk a lot about attainments. And the general way in which they are kind of spoken about or described, it's kind of like, a, I don't know how to put it, but it's kind of this like, yep, I got into samadhi last night. I was there for like five hours. How long were you there? In other words, these attainments start to be these kind of, um, uh, you might call it a form of a spiritual materialism where they start to become these things that people are like proud of and kind of start to proclaim attainments. And the Bodhisattva path as skillful or upayak meditation they're not interested in attainments. They are certainly not interested in talking about attaining anything in that way, but 
they're also basically not interested. The bodhisattva meditation practices tend not to be the deep sensory deprivation, prolonged periods of nothingness. That is considered from the bodhisattva point of view, a little too extreme mm. and ultimately sort of a little too self-serving in that mm -hmm. sense. And so what you find in the bodhisattva path is that the form of meditation that is considered the most ideal, the most upayak, is a form of meditation that you might know of as either the Brahma Viharas or the four immeasurable mind states. So the four Brahma Viharas or the four immeasurables are loving kindness, compassion, empathic joy, and equanimity or upeksha, that relinquishment we were talking about. Now, the idea is, is that these four, metta, karunya, mudita, and upeksha, those are the prescribed bodhisattva meditation in that way. And the idea is, is that metta or loving kindness, metta, loving kindness for all sentient beings becomes the bodhisattva's focus of awareness or a focus. Bodhisattvas are still advised to do the four foundations of mindfulness, by the way. But in addition to those, they are prescribed the focus of loving kindness for all sentient beings. And then moving from loving kindness for all sentient beings to deep compassion for all sentient beings. And then moving to this profound joy for everyone. It's called mudita. And you are meditating on this joy for everyone. They, they call it empathic joy. And then finally, this upeksha, this uh, equanimity or relinquishment. But again, the, the bodhisattva's mind state is that it's very much directed towards all sentient beings in that way. And what I want you to notice is that the practice of the four Brahma Viharas, loving kindness, compassion, empathic joy, and equanimity, they are entirely other focused in that way. And that's a kind of, again, a hallmark, a trademark of the Bodhisattva path is that it's always directed towards all sentient beings in that way. Okay. Any questions about any of that? I've been dropping a lot of Dharma lists on you. We've got four foundations, four immeasurables. Anybody lost? Everybody doing okay? Cool, then I just have one final uh, aspect of upayak meditation or skillful meditation. This is also going to be an, an official part of the Bodhisattva literature. If you were to really study the Bodhisattva path, this, what I'm about to talk about, is what constitutes upaya in terms of meditation. So one key component to the bodhisattva path, the bodhisattva practice, it's something called parinirmana. And parinirmana, it's a very interesting word, actually. It's, a, well, it's such an interesting word, but it gets translated as the transference of merit. And parinirmana, you might often hear it as the uh, dedication of merit. And it's, that's, you know, that's fine. That's like, it, it, it's kind of how it functions 
And what it is, if you don't know what parinamana is, if you don't know what the transference or dedication of merit, basically within the Mahayana Buddhist environment, where the bodhisattva is found, there's an understanding that whenever you do something virtuous or moral, like you maybe maybe you uh, you know you make a bunch of food. Let's say you make a bunch of food and you invite a bunch of um, people over who need some food, and you give away all this food, and that's a virtuous act. Well, at the end of that virtuous act, the idea is is that all of that giving, the giving of all of that food, was was virtuous. It was meritorious. And therefore, whoever gave all that food away has accumulated a mass of merit. Uh, they call it punya, this kind of metaphysical merit that has been generated from a virtuous act. Rather than holding on to that merit that was generated, there is a practice that is called the transference of merit, which is dedicating that merit to the welfare of all sentient beings or to the awakening of all sentient beings. May the merit generated from this practice go to the awakening of all sentient beings. Now, what I want to tell you about is that it's called the dedication of merit because there's this idea that the merit is being dedicated to all sentient beings. And by the way, in the actual world of Buddhism, like the world that we live in, and if you go to various Buddhist monasteries, merit is often dedicated to specific people not just all sentient beings, but this kind of seems to be something that started to become popular in the late medieval period, like around the 1100s or 1200s, where rather than dedicating the merit to all sentient beings, it was being dedicated just to the emperor of China <laughs> or just you know, to specific things. And that tradition has carried over to the modern world where often if somebody has passed away a relative or someone we would do a ceremony and transfer the merit just to that person but i want you to know that back in the day and as far as the bodhisattva literature goes it's always being transferred to all sentient beings but the word parinirmana it has more to do actually with like transmuting or like literally transforming the merit. So it's not about transferring it, like getting rid of it. It's actually about transmuting it, turning it from a personal possession and transforming it to this kind of for the benefit of all beings in that way. And so what you find if you go to like a Zen Buddhist monastery, and let's remember the word Zen means dhyana, like that's just the Japanese way of, of translating or transliterating the word dhyana. So if you're in a Mahayana Buddhist environment, like a Zen monastery, for example, after a meditation, after a meditation session, certainly after like a, a retreat, like a, maybe like a 10-day retreat, there will be a transference of merit ceremony at the end, which is that everybody has been sitting there for days on end, 45 minutes at a time, several times a day, and they've generated all of this goodwill, all of this punya or merit. And so at the end of the meditation or at the end of the, the retreat, all of that will be gathered up, all of the merit, and it will be transferred, again, traditionally to the benefit of all sentient beings. And that is kind of, again, kind of the, the 
primary way that a bodhisattva practices skillful meditation is by not holding on to all of that, the goodness from that practice, but actually transferring it and moving it on. So. All right, everybody. And so on that note, I would like to take all of the merit generated from tonight's class and skillfully transfer it to the benefit of all sentient beings. So, And that'll conclude this kind of a little talk on skillful meditation. Thanks, everybody. Unless anybody has any ideas or comments, questions. All right. <clears throat> and that's going to do it for me, Noam.